In this episode, Canadian Studies professor Dr. Amy Shaw explores a devil-may-care sort of swagger, a case for remembering Canada in the Boer War. The Boer War's relative absence in our national memory is a shame. Having it as part of our narrative could help us understand several elements of late Victorian Canadian society, including ideas about gender roles, perceptions of duty, and how imperialism was understood on an individual level. Dr. Amy Shaw examines how the soldiers were represented and what this might mean about normative manliness and the qualities and behavior of ideal citizens. Through that study, we gain useful insight into the society of the day and into Canadians' relationship to imperialism at the end of the 20th century. I want to talk a little bit today about some aspects of Canada and the Boer War. And because I want to argue that to understand it, we need to look pretty closely at the individuals involved, at um, what they said and did about their voices and their bodies, it seems fitting to start with that. Bert Rook was a surveyor from Manitoba, and he sent a letter to his mother on February the 11th, 1900. Dear mother, I have a little rather interesting news for you. Charlie and I came into town on Wednesday from Selkirk, having finished our job out there. On Thursday night, we were along at Jim's, and while talking, Jim asked me why I didn't join Strathcona's horse and go to South Africa. Charlie spoke up and said, what do you say if we both go? All right, I said, I'm with you. So next morning, we got a letter of introduction from a friend of Jim's to the captain, went up to the barracks, were examined, measured, sworn in, and had two hours drill before night. And we leave for South Africa tomorrow afternoon. His second letter, sent from Ottawa as the troop train headed east, responded to her apparently rather startled reaction to the news that her sons were heading off to war at the other side of the world. Dear Mother, I received your letter last night and was surprised to hear you felt our leaving so much. Of course, it is quite natural that you should be so, but I thought that you would have been glad at the same time. I don't think you could have felt very proud of your family if, out of eight grown sons, you could not send a representative to the front when your country needs them. I am not in the least sorry at having joined. In fact, I am only sorry I did not get away before. All I hope is that we get there in time to have a finger in the pie. There is one thing, dear mother. If we do get there and get snowed under, I hope it will be as a soldier should fall with his face to the front. I'm sure that comforted her a lot. <laughs> um, three of the Rook brothers went to fight in South Africa. Charlie and Bert went first, joining Strathcona's horse. Um, so there's a picture of some of Strathcona's horse there and uh, Samuel Steele, who was the commander of that force. <coughs> they came back after their year was up and re-enlisted in the Canadian Mounted Rifles, taking with them this time their younger brother, George. Bert's explanation of why he wanted to go isn't very different from what volunteers for other wars at other times might have expressed. But the war he fought in is fairly different in the minds of most Canadians today. The ideals that motivated him to travel halfway around the world, largely forgotten. One part of what many people believe history is meant to do, especially military history, is to inculcate nationalism and pride. Give us heroes who will be useful, unifying symbols in a country with what sometimes feels like a few too many divisive forces. Our memories of the First and Second World War work well that way, standing under the gas attack at Ypres, fighting together at Ivimi Ridge, <coughs> battling the Nazis. But if the focus is on simply understanding the past, understanding the ways our predecessors experienced and understood the world, and how this might have shaped our experiences today, we need to be not just aware of the easy kind of feel-good parts, this country sent almost 8,000 men to fight in South Africa around the turn of the last century. We never talk about them. And I think that's a problem. It's not fair to the soldiers, most of whom volunteered expressing high ideals and who almost all endured a great deal of hardship. And it's not fair to the rest of us, 21st century Canadians who want to understand how we got here. 
the war in South Africa wasn't a particularly large-scale conflict, but it was important for Canadians. A lot of the firsts we tend to associate with the First World War actually happened in this one. This was the first time the country sent a large group of men overseas. In many ways, the discourse around this war set the tone for other conflicts of the 20th century, especially in terms of things like the French-English split and the debates about our obligations to Britain. Canadians talked about it in the same spirit they would later talk about the First World War as Canada's coming of age, proving itself on the world stage. The Battle of Partiburg was spoken of in very similar ways to the Battle of Vimy Ridge 17 years later. Where did this war go? I was talking to a colleague a couple of weeks ago, um, and he said he'd been to Ottawa, and he'd gone to the War Memorial, um, and he'd seen the plaque on it for the Boer War and thought, hmm, I've never heard of that. But there were guides there. There were um, students standing around. <coughs> the memorial meant to, I guess, sort of give more information, to flesh out uh, and elaborate on what the memorial was commemorating and give stories to help the tourists. So we went up to one of them, and the guide said that he'd never heard of the Boer War either. <laughs> so they looked it up together. The guide had like an iPad or something, and they probably got somewhere reasonably satisfying, but it sort of proved my point. So, so here we go. <coughs> the war in South Africa, more properly the second Anglo-Boer War, lasted from 1899 to 1902 much longer than anybody expected. It was between the British Empire and the South African republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. You can see them there and at Brown. As with many wars, why it broke out, what people, countries were fighting for and against, depends a bit on who you ask and when you ask them. It was either about keeping hold of an important strategic location that also happened to have some pretty impressive gold and diamond reserves, or it was about protecting the rights of British subjects resident in the republics who were being oppressed by a government which also oppressed its black African population. On the other side, it was a little more clearly about preserving territorial integrity and the Boer way of life, whatever the merits of that might be, against the encroachments of British interest and control in South Africa. Although it was a pretty lopsided conflict, the republics declared war first, enabling Britain to treat this as a defensive war. In terms of the actual fighting, it's generally divided into three phases. The first was, unexpectedly, a period of heavy British losses, which culminated in what was called Black Week in December of 1899. The second was a period of reorganization and reinforcement, ending with the capture of Bloemfontein and Pretoria the capitals of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Everybody assumed this would mean the end of the war. It was kind of a mission accomplished moment. <coughs> there was, however, another two years of bitter guerrilla warfare, during which British frustration with the bitter enders, the Boers who wouldn't stop fighting, led to Lord Roberts's scorched earth campaign and the novelty of the concentration camp. And that's one of the things that I think makes this war interesting and important. Having its beginning in the imperial glory and confidence of the close of Queen Victoria's reign, and its end after numerous unforeseen difficulties in what felt like a much more complicated world, the Boer War works pretty well as a symbolic as well as an actual bridge between the 19th and the 20th century. So, one part of what drew me in here is wanting to understand what the volunteers thought of all this. Why did they go? What did they think of what happened when they got there? And for that, I'm mainly looking at letters and diaries. The other is a little more general, to try to think about how wider Canadian society saw this conflict. We've had a bit from a couple of letters already. We'll get to more later. But I want to start, I think, with a general question, because that seems better for introductions. And I want to do it by looking at the soldiers in a pretty basic, physical way. Soldiers' bodies have never been entirely their own. 
they do as they're told. And their bodies are weapons and sometimes sacrifices. Soldiers give up much control of their bodies, but they don't just do so to the military hierarchy, which decides where and when they put themselves in harm's way. They also put on uniforms and parade and lose themselves again, become not individuals, but symbols to the cheering crowds of their country's strength and values. When they fight, they are Canada. What the public asks them to look like and behave like, then, tells us something of what it thinks Canada is or should be. This is particularly interesting to me when it's the first troops the country has sent away to war. When the country they are personifying is young and has a good deal of colonialism and British imperialism mixed in with its nationalism, so that the soldiers don't just have to be heroic, they also have to show themselves to be British, but also not too British, because North American virtues need to be paraded too. The symbolic burden on men's bodies during Canada's participation in the Second Anglo-Boer War was particularly heavy. I first encountered this when I was reading newspapers from 1899, because that's what I like to do with my free time, and came across a description of the Canadian contingent as composed of fine strapping fellows, broad-shouldered, clean-limbed, and blue-eyed. And I thought, huh, really? All of them? This seems sketchy to me, beyond the ordinary impossibility of Canada's most strapping Aryans spontaneously coming together to fight for cleaner country, because I knew that in the UK, the poor physical quality of the recruits for the Anglo-Boer War caused a national outcry and a sense of crisis about the egregious physical effects of poverty on the working classes. And that article wasn't an anomaly. Newspapers and government rhetoric presented the Canadian soldier in the Boer War as a recognizable physical type. The bodies of the men Canada sent to fight with Britain in South Africa weren't neutral or individual. As in volunteer citizen soldiers, they were the country's representative on the world stage. Looking at them is one way of understanding how the Dominion viewed itself, or at least how it hoped others would view it. This tendency to describe the Canadian contingent as having a distinctive physical appearance and healthy, youthful sense of adventure was a significant component of reporting on them in Canada as they gathered and moved eastward toward their departure. And it continued in descriptions of the arrival of the first Canadian contingent in South Africa. A Cape Town newspaper had reported on their arrival that the Canadians were the finest body of men that has yet come here, except Her Majesty's Guards. They have, as a rule, a light, springy, devil-may-care sort of swagger. The Canadian newspapers repeated the praise to themselves over and over. A devil-may-care kind of swagger was especially good if somebody else was noticing it. Those guys look a little swaggery to me. <laughs> it wasn't just the Canadian contingent generally that had such notable qualities of youthful, rakish manliness. There was a certain competitiveness about the impressive physical characteristics of one's particular regiment or battalion. Alexander Stearns McCormick's memoir, The Royal Canadians in South Africa, is proud of the physical appearance of his colleagues and himself. The finest class of men, he writes, physique exceptional, 50% being six feet or more, few less than five feet nine. Height seems to be a fairly understood shorthand for a sort of combination of physical fitness and handsomeness, I don't know. A. E. Hilder was a member of the second contingent Royal Dragoons, who, like the other Canadian units, was represented as among the country's physical elite. One history notes the remarkable physique of the dragoons. Physical, rigorous physical examination eliminated all but the fittest, one even being rejected because he had a chipped tooth. However, because of bad eyesight in his right eye, Hilda had been turned down in his application to enlist in England's second lifeguards just before he emigrated to Canada and enlisted. And after the war, he was turned down again in his application to join the Rhodesian Mounted Police. Clearly, physical standards were not quite so high as vaunted. 
And though our men were, I'm sure, all incredibly handsome and tall, um, commentators were seeing at least a degree of what they wanted to see. <coughs> J.L. Granitstein and David Barkerson have looked at who enlisted in the first contingent and found that most were city dwellers, only 5% coming from rural areas, and roughly equal numbers, just over 35% in both cases, came from white collar and blue collar employment. Carmen Miller breaks this down further, showing that one volunteer in four had been employed in sales and clerical occupations, even though this category represented only 2.9% of Canada's male workers over 14 years of age. These devil-may-care swaggerers were mostly city people, a lot of them clerks, off perhaps for a taste of adventure, of something they hoped would make them into the confident frontiersmen they were for the moment mostly just emulating. And some of this, this focus on bodies and appearance was just how Victorians talked, how they tried to make sense of the world. People in Victorian times liked generally to organize and classify. They liked to believe that you could tell a criminal or a potential criminal by looking at him because he had distinctive facial features. They liked to believe that men and women were different enough that women wouldn't be able to handle too much vote, too, too much voting, too much education <laughs> or voting. <laughs> and that penchant for exaggerating differences to make categories neater went for ethnic groups too. The importance of corporeal representations of national characteristics in late Victorian times means that the Boers were described in a similarly physical way. <coughs> Proponents of the war justified Canadian participation by publicizing the South Africans' backwardness. One history of South Africa, published in 1900, by a Canadian, J. Castro Hopkins, focused on how things had led inevitably to this conflict, which is a very bad way of doing history. But, uh, and it found it, uh, mainly in Boer ignorance and stubbornness, made worse by their long isolation from Europe. Physically and mentally, Castle wrote, the Dutch farmer is much the same everywhere in South Africa, raw-boned, awkward in manner, slow of speech, fond of hunting wherever and whenever possible, accustomed to the open air, lazy as regards work, but active in pursuits involving personal pleasure. So we have this presentation of the awkward and slow boars, which is in marked contrast to the active and attractive Canadians. The way that the Boer women were described also emphasized their physical lassitude and unattractiveness as well as the sexual inequality of their society. The women of the republics are very ignorant and as mentally feeble as might be expected from their surroundings and history. Physically, stoutness is the end aim of physical ambition and to weigh two or even 300 pounds is the greatest pride of the Dutch women of the Welt. They're, they look normal. In all the pictures I've seen, they totally look normal. Um, they are inever, invariably treated as the inferior sex and even eat apart from the men. So presenting the women as so physically large served to emasculate the Boer men. As well, at a time when societies with greater gender differentiation were perceived as more civilized, this description of the Afrikaner woman as so different from the ideal, delicate angel of the house of British Victorian society added weight to the social Darwinist interpretation of the inevitable and proper demise of less civilized societies before superior British culture. Although their cruelty to black Africans was a steady theme in explanations for the necessity of the war, the Boers were also described as like them and like the indigenous people in North America. Another quote, his covered wagon was to him what the wigwam has been to the savage of the American continent, while his skill in shooting held a similar place to that of the bow and arrow in Indian economy. So in making these characterizations, commentators were using the same argument they had used to justify appropriation of land from indigenous people, that the Europeans, 
here the British, implicitly had a right to the land because the Boers, like the First Nations, were less civilized and not using it to its full extent. British imperial expansion was often justified on the grounds of the benefits of British civilization, the takeover of large parts of the globe appropriate because it brought European ideals, including gender roles and Christianity, um, to the United Peoples. One interesting thing about the Boer War is that it was shoehorned so awkwardly onto that colonial template. The Afrikaners were of Western European origin. They were the descendants of people from the Netherlands who had started settling around Dutch East India Company posts in the 17th century. And they were Christian, most of them following a fairly strict interpretation of Calvinism. But the discourse of imperialism was strong enough that that didn't really change anything. British and Canadian proponents of the conflict simply removed the Boers' markers of whiteness, made them into a primitive African people. And the same went for religion. One newspaper described the contingent of soldiers sent by Canada as missionaries togged in khaki, Bibles on the ends of guns. And a sermon reprinted in another newspaper stated, the Canadians who died in the war did so to send the gospel of Christ to unenlightened people. If some gymnastics were required to make the Boers into indigenous people, a certain kind of mental dexterity was also required for the way that, despite all this talk of their backwardness, the Boers were a surprisingly adept enemy. In spite of their numerical superiority, the British lost fairly badly for the first months of the conflict. Images of Boer lethargy and primitiveness needed to be reconciled with their surprising success against Britain in the early years of the war. And that's something else, I think, that you see in those quotations. The emphasis on the body, both Canadian and Boer, stemmed partly from the way that imperialism had become connected to popular ideas about social Darwinism and race. Many Canadians, because of ethnic, what they would call racial, and political uh, connections to Britain, understood themselves to be the highest expression of evolution. In fact, they were actually kind of better than the British because they lived in Canada. Their racial characteristics were reinforced and improved by geography and climate. Canada was a northern country, and associations with this, with the, the hardiness created by a stern and demanding climate, had been used to express nationalism and pride since Confederation, but became more prominent around the turn of this century. So, with their impressive racial qualities, enhanced by geography and frontier lifestyle, the soldiers' bodies revealed the qualities the nation imagined for itself and that they wished other people to see. This seems to be sort of a cowboy mixed with an imperial gentleman. The soldiers' bodies also served more specifically British goals. This was a sign of the vitality of the empire. The colony's enthusiasm was brought forward as implicit evidence of the war's righteousness. Internationally, Britain faced a lot of opprobrium for the war. Even in the beginning, the rest of Europe criticized the fight against two tiny, diamond-rich republics. And the way the war degenerated in its last half didn't help matters. One thing that Britain brought forward in its answers to this was the enthusiasm of the colonies. If the men of Canada and Australia and New Zealand young and strong and eager and wholesome with their straight backs and their bright eyes were coming, then surely this was a good war. The focus on imperial troops' bodies enhanced the legitimacy of the war in other ways as well. The war in South Africa was not fought against professional soldiers. The Boers were civilians, many of them farmers, or means farmer. While there had been some effort to gather more weapons in the months leading up to the war, they fought mainly with what they had, wearing the clothes they had. The war absence of uniforms was often commented on in Canadian diaries and letters home. Shapeless hats and dirty and ill-fitting clothes stood in obvious and poor contrast to the military bearing of their opponents. Their beards were also frequently noted and another point of evidence 
of their backwardness and untidiness. I'm sorry to all the bearded people here. <laughs> British civilization was a big part of the discourse of the war, and the bodies of the whiskered, slovenly boars marked them for the dustbin of history in the face of the clean-shaven and well-dressed presentation of their opponents. In a book called With the Royal Canadians, a journalist who we would now probably describe as embedded with the Royal Canadians, writes about their doings, including their part in the Battle of Paderberg. This was a battle in February of 1900 that was important because it was the first British victory after a long line of demoralizing losses. And everyone made a big deal of the fact that Canadian troops were part of the battle. The British made a big deal of it because it showcased the unity of empire and because Canada maybe still needed a little encouraging because the country hadn't quite jumped into the war with both feet. And Canada made a big deal of it because it showed they were very good at fighting, which they'd sort of expected all along. The victory seemed especially significant because it fell on Majuba Day, the anniversary of a British defeat at Majuba Hill 19 years before during the first Anglo-Boer War. It seemed fitting that the disaster at Majuba had been avenged by Canadians, revealing imperial unity and the Dominion's coming of age. So that, um, sorry, I think when I turn my head, my voice goes away, doesn't it? I'll just stand very straight. Um, the one painting there uh, commemorates that victory of Canadians at Paderberg. The painting is called Majuba Day. And I think at one time it was pretty famous, uh, something you might see copies of in school hallways or in textbooks. Has anybody seen it before? It's fine, because my main argument is you don't know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> so there's Majuba Day. Lord Roberts, the British general, spoke to the battalion and praised their spirit and gallantry, tributes he had incorporated into his dispatch to the British government earlier that day. Canadian, he asserted, now stands for bravery, dash, and courage. And we have a lot of talk about Canada coming of age in this war, particularly around this battle. According to one spokesman, Canadians did not rejoice because Konya was defeated, but because their sons had become men in the eyes of the world. <coughs> so the journalist, Stanley McKeon Brown was his name, wrote about the victory at Paderberg and about the surrender of Piet Cronje and his troops afterwards. He made a lot of interesting comments about how messy and unmilitary the Boer posts were found to be after they abandoned them. And he described Kronje's surrender. Kronje met the hero of Khartoum. OK, so the hero of Khartoum is Lord Kitchener. Lord Kitchener was involved here, but as you can tell by the picture, that's Lord Roberts. Lord Kitchener was Roberts' um, chief of staff, I think. So there's a little bit of confusion here. <laughs> Roberts is Roberts of Kandahar. I don't know if he was having a cake. This, so Kanye met the hero of Khartoum, or didn't, um, with a sullenness typical of the Dutch towards English. And with his haggard eyes, reddened after the style of a bloodhound, gazed on him disconsolately. And as the tall British general stood in front of the captive leader, the latter with his low, thick-set stature, his partly bald head and newly trimmed whiskers, showed little interest in the meeting. To the congratulations of having put up a jolly good fight at Paderberg, Kronje seemed utterly oblivious. And with little ado, Lord Kitchener was soon back at his place in the special. So the physical difference here is notable. Talk about height and bearing and attitude. Kronje also doesn't know how to do a war properly. When congratulated on his jolly good fight in defense of his homeland, he is sullenly silent. Not a good sport at all. <coughs> right after this description, Brown put forward a sketch of the Afrikaners generally. He wrote that everybody asked him what the Boers were like. And so he responded, picture an anemic, sunburned farmer with unkempt whiskers and hair, round-shouldered and stooped, lazily pulling at a cheap pipe, a greasy and battered soft slouch hat, a badly fitting tweed or corduroy suit, Schoenwald, which are low-heeled shoes, um, a man with an aversion to the sea and a double antipathy towards soap, and you have him. 
The journalist describes one soldier's threat to a prisoner that he wanted to pour water down your neck as quite horrifying to this person who had faced days of enemy fire with apparent equanimity. Their dirtiness and sullenness was emphasized, I think, because it helped to negate their ethnic similarity to their opponents and make them into a people who needed a British civilizing mission. But this dichotomy of chaos and civilization inscribed on the bodies of the fighting men was often a false one. The Anglo-Boer War is full of famous problems of strategy and organization. More soldiers died of disease than were killed, especially of dysentery from drinking bad water. In their chasing around of the more mobile enemy, the British and colonial troops frequently outmarched their supply wagons and were chronically short of food and water and tents. One soldier from the Royal Canadians, and in an otherwise fairly laudatory account, wrote, our men were dirty, lousy, unwashed, unshaved, uniforms ragged, boots sometimes falling apart when the ground was rocky. Except when in garrison, 90% of the British grew beards, water was too scarce for shaving. So this picture of the kempt and orderly British as the personification of their civilization and the righteousness of their cause, and the haphazard and untidy boars as physical evidence of their backwardness and the propriety of their defeat didn't reflect reality. After some months of fighting, the two looked increasingly alike. <coughs> Most boars didn't stop fighting after the capitals were taken. And they knew the territory so much better, and they had the support of the local population so that it was taking so long and costing so much money and so many people to try to defeat them in conventional ways that the British moved to unconventional measures. They began a scorched earth campaign, during which, those, during which the farms of those thought to be aiding the commandos were burnt, sometimes their fields were salted, and their occupants were moved into concentration camps. Other people were moved into camps too, just based on location and British plans for an area. Now, these weren't concentration camps in a Nazi World War II sense of things. The British weren't trying to kill off all the South Africans. They were concentrating them in a camp. And this was a pretty new thing. The Spanish and Americans had a tiny jump on the British here. The first time concentration camps were used was against Cubans when they rose up against Spain in the late 1890s. And then the Americans used them against the Filipinos in the Spanish-American War that followed. Britain criticized both these actions severely, but also apparently took notes. So the British weren't explicitly trying to kill people in the camps, but they did. Because of crowding, unhygienic conditions, and general maladministration, over 28,000 detainees, largely women and children, died in the camps. The men were usually off in separate prisoner of war camps in places like St. Helena and Bermuda. Another 15,000 died in separate camps for black Africans. Now, one thing that draws historians sometimes to wartime, even the ones who aren't really interested in strategy or weapons or who sometimes find the whole thing quite unbearably sad, even those historians, um, is that it leaves behind documents. Soldiers write letters, or they did. The connection to home and friends was really important, especially in the long, boring periods between the fighting. So they wrote. And sometimes these were the only times in these people's lives that they wrote letters, especially those who were less educated, working people. And these letters were kept. Day-to-day -day correspondence often gets lost over the years, but soldiers' letters tend to get be saved, kept, treasured in a box for generations, reminders either of a lost loved one or of a dramatic adventure from one's youth. The letters are frustratingly one-sided conversations usually. People at home saved the letters from their men away at war, but the soldiers didn't do the same. They couldn't carry much as they marched across the sweltering belt so we often have to guess at the other side of a conversation. But we do have these documents, these voices from people who might otherwise not get a voice in history, talking about the weather, talking 
a lot about the weather, talking about how their family members needed to write more often and send presents, mostly snacks, more often, and writing about what they did and felt. And that's one way that I think that the soldiers' letters are particularly important here in this war for us here in Canada because the Boer War turned into kind of a mess in the end. And Canadians were part of that mess. And they didn't really do a lot of soul searching about that, either at the time or later. Britain had a fairly strong anti-war movement. They were called disdainfully the pro-Boers. Future Prime Minister Henry Campbell Bannerman's denunciation of what he called the methods of barbarism deployed by his country's army was perhaps the most famous example. In Canada, protest against the methods of the last two years of the war was comparatively weak. Indeed, attention to the war generally faded in the Canadian press as time went on. Stories about the war were much less numerous and prominent in 1901 and 1902 than at its outbreak. And there are, strangely, a fair number of Canadian histories of the Boer War published in 1900, as though it was over. And Canadian historians have generally followed that lead. Britain did a certain amount of soul searching about what it had done, or British historians did anyway. A lot of that in the 1970s, maybe thinking about some of the similarities with Vietnam. And the United States, which was doing some similar things, using a similar ideology at a similar time in the Spanish-American War, has had its historians analyzing and publicizing its behavior there a fair bit. Not so much in Canada. One explanation that I've come across for this forgetfulness is that it's because the country's responsibility was light. Canada didn't have to think too much about this because it wasn't Canada's decision. Civilians went into concentration camps because the British commander said that civilians had to go into concentration camps. Canadians, colonials themselves, were just obeying orders. And sure, but pretending it didn't happen doesn't help anybody because Canadians took part in this and it affected them. And it's something we can access, at least to a degree, because they wrote about it sometimes in their letters and diaries. Some of what is usually called foraging in Letters Home was the soldiers taking animals and other foodstuffs from farms. And this was a combination of punishment to the Boers and a reaction to the fact that Britain had serious logistical difficulties in getting food and supplies to its own soldiers. So this was partly practical. Canadians, though, had a reputation in some quarters for not only being particularly good at gathering food in this way, but also of sometimes going beyond their orders in the severity of their response to farmers thought to be aiding the commandos. One English soldier wrote, very admiringly, of one group of Canadians, there are some very good stories afloat about Strathcona's horse. They are a long way superior to all the other mounted corps. One report is they lynched six boars near Standerton hanging them for the usual white flag farmhouse game. So this is uh, something that the boys were accused of doing quite a lot, where they would put a white flag up at the farmhouse, and then when the soldiers came in, they would shoot at them. So this is something that really obviously angered uh, the British. Just as they had finished, a staff officer came up in a towering rage and called them murderers, etc. One of the Yanks looked them up and down for some time and then said, I guess, stranger, there is room for another one up there. The I have to do that in a John Wayne voice, but I can't do it in a John Wayne voice, but if you could imagine. <laughs> um, the staff officer quickly departed. They will go anywhere. If a patrol is sniped at, they don't stop, but go for the sniper. The Boers really fear them. We are very sorry we haven't got them here with us now. They're very good at looting. I think some of this is apocryphal. I don't think the soldier really threatened to lynch the officer or that he did so in a John Wayne style. This was part of the persona of frontier manliness that they were cultivating and that others, like the English, expected and admired of them. But the killing of the Boers does seem fairly likely to have happened. There's reference to it in other places. <laughs> 
There's a reference to what seems to be the same incident in Rook's memoirs, for example, which he said, gave all the Canadian mounted troops a rather sinister name throughout the country afterwards. Rook was with the Strathconas, but he didn't witness the event, which involved a combination of Canadians and members of the local South African Light Horse, so a force from the British colonies in South Africa. He wrote, I have no definite proof that this incident actually happened as related, although I was riding in the same line within a mile or two. But the troop of our fellows who were concerned in it were fairly capable of it, being a BC troop, largely, <laughs> largely composed of miners, lumbermen, etc. Moreover, the South Africans were naturally very bitter over their comrades being shot down from the cover of that white flag, and I'm pretty well convinced that it occurred. It certainly struck through the army, and it was one of the incidents used by the Boers to accuse our troops of violating the laws of war, though it was their men doing that very thing which caused it. So the tension between varieties of manliness is evident here. The retributive lynching is exalted as an example of frontier masculinity, one for which these Canadians were well known, and Rook saw the reports of crimes as credible because of who was committing them miners and lumberlemen, so themselves archetypes of a certain kind of rough, self-reliant manliness. At the same time, Rook seems uncomfortable with the event. He didn't mention it in his letters home. And when farm burnings come up in his, later in his memoir, he recasts them as being within the realm of British codes of civility. He writes, During this march, the troops destroyed many fields of corn and kaffir corn or millet, the policy evidently being to compel surrender of the commandos by cutting off their food supplies. All the supply of meat for the troops was obtained by rounding up sheep and cattle. But I believe as careful a check as possible was kept of everything used and destroyed, and after the war was over, compensation was paid wherever valid claims were presented. The women and children on the farms in this territory were not disturbed, and they were given vouchers for chickens, pigs, and other produce commandeered. While well, soldiers commandeering food during a war in which their superiors had serious difficulties providing adequate provisions might be passed over as a necessity, the line between commandeering and looting was not always a fine one. Charlie Tweedle wrote in his diary about his brigade's arrival in the town of Jacobsdall. As soon as the brigade was dismissed, all hands ran toward the little town and captured all the cattle, sheep, pigs and fowl they could lay hands on. It was a sight of a lifetime to see the Kilties and all the other regiments capturing and butchering fresh meat for our dinners. Some made for the gardens and rooted up all they could find, watercress, watermelons, corn and fruit in small quantities. The boys ransacked all the houses and took all sorts of things. Some got jewelry, some got albums full of pretty photos. Some went in for clothes, such as pants, shirts, handkerchiefs, shawls, etc., etc., some got parasols and Japanese fans, straw hats, ostrich feathers, ribbons, and all sorts of truck. I was looking for grub, but got very little in that line. I got three bottles of herbs for flavoring meats or soups, a lot of ladies' belts, and some photos and statues. As we were outward bound, I might say, every weight tells, so I left or gave away nearly all I had commandeered. The First World War is sometimes called the most ironic war in the sense that it was the most different from what those going into it expected. But I think that can be seen here too. The fit between what they were being asked to do and the war's stated aim of bringing British civilization to South Africa was, at best, awkward. And this can be seen pretty clearly in the actions taken against Boer's houses. The home was usually understood in late Victorian times as a feminine space. There is a sharp clash between imperial directives about capturing goods from farms and houses and towns, and the men's gendered role as protectors of the home that tangles up the ends and means of the war for those fighting in it. On March 23, 1902, the Boers sued for peace, and the Peace of Vereniging was declared on the 31st of May. In 1906, the republics were granted self-government, and in 1909, with the former Boer commander, Louis Botha, as prime minister, they joined the old British colonies to form the Union of South Africa. 
by the First World War, Jan Smuts, another former British Boer commando leader, was sitting in the Imperial War Cabinet talking about British military policy with David Lloyd George and the other British and colonial leaders. So the guy in the uniform on the end, that's Smuts. Um, and on the other end of the first row is um, Alfred Milner, who is like a key voice in British imperial policy. He'd been one of the people in South Africa saying, nope, we can't solve problems here without war. So to me, this is a really interesting picture. Um, the little short guy in the middle is uh, David Lloyd George, who's the prime minister during the First World War, but who was also a really vocal uh, pro-Boer, like person against the Boer War in Britain uh, during it. Um, and the guy beside him, who you might recognize from the money, is uh, Robert Borden, the prime minister. So. <laughs> if you count medical personnel and special constables, more than 8,000 men and women participated directly in the Canadian war effort in South Africa. At least 270 of them died, either in battle or of illness. And comparatively, 159 people died in Afghanistan, Canadians died in Afghanistan, 378 in Korea. These are comparable numbers. So why has it been largely forgotten? Probably a combination of factors. The First World War, so much larger in scale and following only a dozen years after the end of the war in South Africa, overshadowed it in our memory. The imperial relationship changed so that fighting for the glory of the British Empire became a little less laudable, a little more difficult to talk about and expect a ready understanding or sympathy. Our war member memories broadly tend to be linked to nationalism or increasing independence. How do we say, remember that time we were a good, loyal colony? The forgetting might also be connected to the war being overshadowed by other South African conflicts. Apartheid, for example, could be seen as evidence that the war was unsuccessful since the Boers' racial subjugation of black South Africans was one of the putative reasons the soldiers went. We're not good at memorializing losses or defeats. The humanitarian failure in the last part of the war, the farm burnings and concentration camps, has undoubtedly made it easier to forget, too. It's just not comfortable. But we shouldn't forget about wars, simply because they have parts that we're not comfortable with, if some of what we wanted from them didn't quite work out, or they were fought for values that aren't the same as today's. It's just as important to remember the awkward wars, the ones where we can't remember now quite why we went, or in which we maybe found ourselves behaving with something less than our usual integrity. It's just as important to remember those as it is to remember the celebrated wars, the ones in which our opponents were clearly dangerous, their victims clearly needed us, and we conducted ourselves fairly well. It might even be that it's more important. Thank you.